So I know that most of you have been here to work on your PBL practice. And think of this conference as a pedagogical conference to help you with your pedagogy and to perfect PBL. So I know that when I take on this assignment, I'm going to stretch you a little because I want to ask you, as you'll hear from me, the pedagogical work is the most important work. So if we don't impact classrooms and the way education is taught, we will never have 21st century education. But I need to stretch you a little because PBL and classroom practice will not get us where we want to go by itself. And each of you need to do just a little bit more than just be great practitioners of PBL. So I want to, I want to, uh, here's what I'm going to cover, but I really only have two points I'm trying to make this morning. One is that all of us have got to be prepared to lead 21st century education. All of us, whether we're teacher leaders or whether we're administrators, we all got to be prepared to help lead our classrooms, our schools, and our districts towards 21st century education. And secondly, when we talk about it, we got to be thoughtful about when we're talking about the goals of 21st century education and when we're talking about the strategies like PBL. And so if I can get you all over the next 45 minutes to think about how not just to think about your classroom practice, but to think about how you're going to advocate and lead efforts to move PBL and 21st century education forward, I will consider myself successful. So I wanted to start with a story that involves John Mergendoller. He and I were in Massachusetts about a month ago. And we were asked by a superintendent there named uh, Tony Bent. It's an extraordinary superintendent who's got about a group of 25 superintendents around the state that are working on 21st century education, global competency. And he asked the two of us to come and co-present. And interestingly enough, we've never co-presented before. And so we had a, a presentation called 21st Century Education and PBL. And it went great. And as John succinctly stated, which I loved, he said, 21st century education is the what, and PBL is the how, which seems to me to be a very elegant summary of how to think about the relationship between the two subjects. But this, the real story I want to share with you happened the next morning, which is Tony Bent, the same Tony Bent superintendent, and I were invited onto a panel at Harvard. And it was a panel, uh, it was a three-day conference very much like this one with pr teacher practitioners working on global competence. If you're interested in that topic, look for Fernando Reimers. Got a great conference called the Global Education Think Tank at Harvard. It's fabulous. But, but Tony and I were asked near the end of the conference to come in and help those practitioners think about leadership. And they had been there working on global competence pedagogy for three days. It's very analogous to this. And we started the session by saying, you've been excited by your practice for the last three days. We can tell you're totally excited. But you've got to go back home. What is it that you're worried about when you get back home? This teacher shot up her hand. And she says, I'm worried when I get back home that my principal and my superintendent won't support my work on global competence. And Rosanna already asked you, some of you are worried about that, right? You've had this incredible experience for three days. Am I going to get the support I need above to do this work? Tony then says to her, I want you to think about the fact that principals and superintendents are just political animals and that they're going to respond to what people within their world tell them to do. 
And what you need to do is be active when you get home, create a group around global competence, and let the principal or superintendent know that they don't have a choice but to work on global competence. And I immediately responded. I said, in front of everybody, I said, Tony, respectfully, I'm not sure I like that answer. And he said, why not? I said, because there are 50, 60 leaders in this room, and I'm afraid that when they hear you say what you said, that you're, you're gonna, you've just let them off the hook. The administrators, the principals, the superintendents. Are they going to feel compelled that they need to have their own vision, that they need to lead? Why are they sitting around just waiting for teachers to tell them that PBL or global competence is the right next best thing? I think the leaders need to provide a vision for their schools and their districts. So I was flying out of Boston the next day, and I realized that neither Tony or I had given the right answer. Neither Tony or I had given the right answer, which is it was a both and, right? The answer is that every teacher needed to feel that they needed to go back and do more than just practice global competence. They do need to think about leading. But every administrator's got to do more than sit around waiting. And we have 60 administra new administrators show up today, and I hope that the message to them is you're not sitting around waiting for your teachers to tell you PBL is the right thing to do. You've got to provide a bigger vision than that. So what I'm going to do over the course of my talk is I want you to think about what each of you in this room are prepared to do beyond changing your pedagogy. What are you prepared to do to lead? What are you going to do to lead PBL in your department, in your PLC, in your school? What are you prepared to do to lead 21st century education? And when do you talk about each? And then at the end, I'm going to ask you to tweet your commitment. So that's why I want you to, that's why I want you to listen. So that's my, uh, that's my message from Boston. So to get you started, though, I wanted to, I, I've been on a 12-year journey to figure out how to help people see that we need a new model of education in this country. I started this work in 2001, and I've been going around the country, and I'll give you some tools that I've come up with in a few minutes to help articulate it, but maybe the biggest breakthrough and the most helpful breakthrough is I went to my friends at Fable Vision. How many of you are familiar with them? They're just phenomenal animators. And I said to these guys, I want you to do a project to help us think about how to tell the story of 21st century education and the four C's in a way that people might understand why we need a new model of education in this country. So I want you to reflect on what part of this animation res res you, do you res personally respond to. And then I'm going to ask you to pick a neighbor and share your mutual perceptions about what part of above and beyond uh, you find resonates with you? It was a warm spring morning down at the Main Street schoolyard. Excitement was in the air. Hey, check this out said Charlie. The school's Going Places contest has been announced. Come on, let's go get our kits. <laughs> and so the kits were handed out. Every one identical. Every one with a set of precise instructions. Each student set off to work. Charlie knew how to follow directions. He made great progress and was quite proud of his work. Meanwhile, Maya was taking her time. She watched the world around her, noticing other ways things go places. The next morning, Charlie was finished and carefully inspected his work. But a noise interrupted his thoughts. Wow, said Charlie. What is that? 
You didn't follow the directions, did you? I started to, said Maya, but I wanted to try something different. Uh, Maya, what does that have to do with a go-kart? asked Charlie. Who said it had to be a go-kart? Hmm, suddenly my project doesn't look very exciting. <laughs> oh, but you're a great builder, said Maya. Hey, maybe we should work together. And so they did. First, they compared notes. Charlie was good at details. Maya, good at dreaming up ideas. Each had a different approach to getting things done. Then they got to work. Side by side, they helped one another to build something new, something inspired, something spectacular. The next morning, everyone gathered for the final challenge, the big race. Each student stood alongside his or her finished project, each cart a perfect replica. Well, almost perfect. Ready? asked Charlie. Ready as I'll ever be, said Maya. Some of the other students weren't so convinced. Ha! You may think you're going places, but you're just going to lose. Students, start your engines. On your mark, get set. Charlie shouted, Maya, they're all ahead of us. What are we waiting for? No worries, said Maya. Flaps down, throttle up. What? Whoa, did you see that? And we have our winners. Charlie and Maya were ecstatic. We did it. We finished, said Charlie. Finished? I don't think so. We've only just begun. Right. Flaps down, throttle up. And off they went. They really were going places. They were going above and beyond. Okay, what do you think? Yeah, you liked it? Oh, good. So why don't you pick a, a neighbor and share per, your perceptions of what was the message that really resonated with you? Why don't you just spend a minute or two sharing your perspectives with each other? Obviously, the, it, it, it was a successful video. All right. And you can, by the way, you can find this video on the P21 site, p21.org, if you want to use it. Um, so without spending a lot of time, just share with me one or two perceptions of what, what you thought about the video. Somebody. What do you like about the video? Yes, sir. It doesn't have to look a certain way. It doesn't have to look a certain way. Yeah. Any other thought? I guess the two things that, that, that occur to me is one, it really does a nice job of talking about the era in which I went to school, which is we were basically told to follow instructions. And if you followed instructions, you'd have a career for 30 years. And that's not true anymore for our kids. What's the PBL? I, I, until I prepped for this, I never had thought about what's the PBL message in, in this? Uh, in this video? Collaboration. Well, collaboration, but what else? Voice. Sorry? Voice. Well, I, what, what struck me was not all projects are created the same, right? The guy was working on a project. This is what John says, and not every project is project-based learning. The kid was, first kid was working on a project. He wasn't not working on a project, but the the young woman turned that into something very different. But the assignment, 
was what he was working on. Follow the instructions and replicate. That was what I was told to do in the 50s. So um, I think it gives us a lot of food for thought about what it is we're trying to do with PBL. We're actually trying to create kids that don't just follow instructions, but have a series of other capabilities. And um, I, you know, a part of my being here, I think, is that I want you to think long and hard about how you tell the story of why you need PBL. I, I've had a, way, a war waging with my friend Bernie Trilling, and some of you know him, who's a great leader and author on PBL and 21st century education. And when we started the Partnership for 21st Century Skills 10 years ago, he said to me, Ken, when you go around the country, you've got to talk more about PBL. Why aren't you telling people 21st century education is PBL? And I said, I can't do that. When I walk into a room and I get 250 parents, business leaders, students together, and I say to them, in the 21st century, your kids need to critically think and problem solve. They need to collaborate. They need to communicate. They need to be creative and innovative. I don't get a lot of pushback. I mean, people want to argue about one or the other, or they want to add a couple, but they don't fundamentally disagree. When I get people in a room and I say, this is all about project-based learning, half of them have never even heard the term. And the other half are split on what they think about PBL. So I have a very major piece of advice for you, which is, when you're at a conference like this, and you're talking to practitioners, you're talking to educators, it can all be about PBL. It's great. But when you end up going into your communities, and you talk to parents, and you talk to business leaders, and you talk to other people that aren't really the practitioners of education, it's got to be about what capabilities their young people need to have. That's what's got to drive the conversation. And they're more than willing to have that conversation. They're excited about that conversation. I've been doing that conversation in communities all over this country for a decade, and people are excited to have it. And 85% of it, people are in concurrence. So what I want you to think about is, how do you talk about this topic with the broader audience? So this is the, a lot of you know the rainbow, right, from the Partnership for 21st Century Skills. I, I want to, again, like I did with, you know, saying Tony and I didn't get it right, I don't think we got this right when we put this out. I, I want to say in a way we partially failed, but um, Maya Angelou, who some of you have heard at some of the National Education Conference, she has this great line. She says, failure is just a data point. <laughs> I love that. This is a big data point. There were 18 skills in this model, and it was too many for people to get their brains around. You can't get people to understand 18 of anything, I've now learned. I don't think. So it was when we moved to the four C's that this movement really started taking off. 2007, 2008, because people go, oh, that's what you're talking about. You're talking about critical thinking. You're talking about communication. You're talking about collaboration. You're talking about creativity. That's what's important. And these were the ones that everybody prioritized as the most important things that young people need in the 21st century. So I want to give you a little tool to help you think about, this is what I've been doing the last year, to help you think about how you might talk about whether we need a new model of education or not. OK? So here's student A. Can you all see him? Somebody last month said to me, that looks like you in the 1950s. <laughs> it's actually, I did look a lot like that, actually. How many of you feel, when you were in K through 12, that this was fundamentally the model of K through 12 education? Raise your hands. 
almost the whole room. How many of you think that today, in the schools and districts that you're in, that this is still fundamentally the model for K through 12 education? Raise your hands. Okay, still over half the room. Okay. Now, here's student B. Student B has to be able to master content, right? Has to be able to critically think and problem solve, be an effective communicator, be an effective collaborator, be creative and innovative. By the way, some of these outcomes on the right were attributes that those of us in the system on the left got, but they weren't the intentional and purposeful outcomes. They were just sort of, this is what you get when you're in an educational system, you get some of this. I'm talking about this as the intentional and purposeful model for education, okay? Now, I'm gonna ask a couple of rhetorical questions, but just bear with me. I think we all know most of the answers, but let's just bear with me. You're an employer. You're an employer, and you're hiring somebody for a job in a company. Which of these two students are you gonna hire, A or B? Okay, is it a close call? All right, is there anybody here that would like to hire student A? Would prefer to hire student A? Okay, why? No, 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 but tell me, you wanted to hire them. What's the job you're going to put them on? Okay. Well, I had somebody actually with a slightly different answer last month say to me, I definitely want student A. So student B might fit your bill, though. I, it, I wouldn't preclude that student B... If, if, I guess here's the answer. If you had student A who had the content, but student B who had the content and those four additional skills, would you still hire A over B? Okay. Well, I had somebody walk up to me and say, I'm for sure on student A. I said, why? They said, because I have a road assignment. I want them to do over and over again. I don't want them to ask me any questions. <laughs> okay. I said, well, that works great, but... For their next three to five jobs, they may need a different skill set. I can understand you being happy. Okay, citizen. Student A or student B, who would be the better citizen? Okay. Anybody want citizen A? You'd all want citizen B. Okay, work in a, you want citizen A? Okay, go ahead. You can control them. I had that, by the way, I was in, I was in a Eureka on Monday and somebody said, it depends on which country. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully in the United States we'd prefer student B, but you're, the, fair point, fair point. Which, pick your favorite not-for-profit. School district, church, youth group, you want to hire somebody to work at the not-for-profit, which, student A or student B? Okay. So here's my question. All of us, I mean, a couple of you, by all means, hire student A. By the way, you can find them in great, in great quantity right now. So you're not going to have any trouble hiring them. The question is, is whether they're really ready for 21st century life. So here's my question. My question is, why, if... We know we want student Bs. Why do we still have a system that's still intent upon producing student A? Pardon? I can't hear you. Oh, got it. Pacing calendars. Dollars? Would you, would you, by the way, you think, that's an interesting question. So you think that we're, we're producing student A because it's cheaper. Is that right? Pardon? Because it's all of a sudden people have time. Okay, time, yes. It's, a, it's much easier to measure how student A's are doing, how teachers are doing great in student A's. Right. And all of that okay. But look, this is a good reflection for you all to have because in your business, if you're here all week working on PBL, you're trying to produce student B, right? So I want you to be able to tell the story of why it is that we need student Bs in this country. And we do. By the way, here's the only thing I say. 
three to five careers, 10 to 15 jobs is what your students are going to face over the next 30 years. Which of these skill sets will prepare them for all of that change? To say nothing of the turbulence in the society over that period of time. So I think what I want you to be able to do is tell the story of why the four C's are important and why you all think we need a conversation in addition to a conversation about PBL. There's a part of the system that needs a conversation about what are the real objectives of our 21st century educational system. So the other piece that I wanted to cover with you just for a few minutes is that how many of you, by the way, let me ask you another question. How many of you feel like you either work in or you have uh, visited a 21st century school or district, that you've really seen a 21st century school or district? So it's only about 20% of you, 25% of you. So the other thing I want you to have in your mind is that when you think about a 21st century school or district, are you just thinking about PBL? No. It needs to be something more than PBL. And so I want you to leave here thinking about what's the context in which a full school, a full school district, needs to really think about 21st century success for the whole system, not just for your classroom. And what I found, I've now been visiting these districts for over a decade, that there are four criteria that I see over and over again that seem to be the sine qua nons for a 21st century school or district. I see them over and over and over again. So the first is strong leadership. And We've been talking about th already this morning about the importance of leadership, but I want to give you a concrete example of a great leader. The superintendent in this district, anybody here from Ohio? We have some Ohioans? Yes? I mean, the, you're, 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 you came in f to this conference from Ohio? Great. So this is Upper Arlington outside of Columbus. They worked on their 21st century outcomes for 18 months with an, a community advisory group of, 18, of 50 people. And if you read the black layer there, if you can read it, it's the four C's, critical thinking, communication, collaboration, creativity, plus global citizenship and self-direction. Those are their six 21st century outcomes. And they asked me to come and do a big opening day four C's rally, you know, speech and get all of their teachers, their 400 teachers, get them all excited about teaching the four C's for the next school year. So when I was done, I knew that they had taken this and created a decal of it. When I was done, the superintendent comes up and gives me a 79 cent target plate with this decal on it. And I didn't really say anything. I, you know, privately, I probably shouldn't say this out loud, but this is the thought that ran through my head. I came all the way from Tucson, Arizona to Columbus, Ohio, and I got a 79-cent target plate. Well, I, I was very gracious. I sat down, and the next thing I know, the superintendent tells his team to bring out boxes of these plates. Now I knew why he wanted them 79 cents. He had bought a plate with a decal on it for all 400 members of his team. And they're handing it out. They took the time to hand it out. And he didn't say another word till every teacher had that plate on their lap. And finally, he says to them, for the last 18 months, while we've been working on the four C's in 21st century education, a lot of you teachers have walked up to me and you've asked me whether four C's in 21st century education is just one more thing you're adding to my plate. And he goes, this is the plate. This is the plate. So the question for all of us is, do we have leaders in our schools and our districts that are defining our 21st century plate? And think about how much, how powerful it would be. Thinking about the question Rosanna asked you at the very beginning. Think about how much more powerful it would be if you knew that you were doing PBL in a district that had embraced these six outcomes. 
you'd be doing this work. That is the work of PBL. But my challenge to you is how do we get schools and districts that don't have this vision to have it? So you may go back and say, I had a great three days focused on project-based learning, but I also think we need a vision. We need a direction for our school. We're not a 21st century school or district. We haven't even articulated that intention without some agreement as to what capabilities we want our kids to have beyond mastering content of four subjects. So we mentioned the book, but if you all want something concrete to do, not all of you will want to read a book on leadership and seven steps for schools and districts. But I have a modest suggestion. If it's too self-serving, I'll understand your. I have a suggestion for an early Christmas present for your principal and superintendent. <laughs> so take a look at the book. And you know, maybe you could hand it to them personally, and maybe you have to slip it under their door anonymously. <laughs> but think about getting this issue in front of them. The second piece, and this is, you know, all know this, but I need to say it, when you walk into a 21st century school or district, you walk into a, collaboration, a collaborative environment that is distinctive. You really can feel it. So I wanted to share with you a remarkable story of a district that has articulated 12 21st century outcomes. But they didn't go directly to the issue of, are we now going to inf in inform, are we now going to embrace PBL? This district took 150 of its best teachers and asked them to define the definition of a 21st century global teacher for purposes of teacher evaluation. It's stunning. And watch this. <laughs> The first day we came, very much deer caught in the headlights. I would say walking in was a little overwhelming with a huge group and not knowing exactly what the work ahead of us was and kind of starting with a, a clean slate of um, creating targets that we didn't even know maybe existed before we started the work. So, Starting with the big picture seemed scary. Mm -hmm. and then we started to break down definitions. Then we started to link it to, okay, how, how are we be evaluated? And changing those terms to usable terms in our classrooms, usable terms in our schools, and then linking that to how can we work together as a community of teachers to build the definition, and then take that back to our schools and relate it again as being representatives of this work is, is key to the whole process. As we dove in, I was starting to understand it, and now as the fourth week, I feel like I truly get sight. I get how all the world-class targets work together. The 12 targets are not scary anymore. You understand them. You think you can pretty much reach them, you're going to have to push yourself. But I think it's feasible. I don't think the 12 <laughs> targets are that un unattainable. I don't either. I Looking don't at either. how they connect, like I said, to the, to the site stuff, it's, if I'm working as a teacher to be evaluated as highly effective, if that's my goal, the targets are going to fall right in line. We're not striving to be just good teachers, we're striving for that wow challenging us to think about what makes really exemplary teaching. No matter where we are that we're creating targets so teachers can continue to have goals for growth and it's just like we do with our students even our most high achieving students we still want to set targets and goals that they're continuing to grow. For that wow teacher are you truly doing this 90 to 100 percent of your day to affect change in your students? It's going to like you said challenge those mm -hmm. teachers who may have been stuck in a box to break the walls down. I mean, I could be a person that becomes very satisfied in what, what I do because I've taught for 38 years, but I have no problem being pushed and try to go to the next level and get better. When kids master a concept, they master a standard, I don't say, oh, take the rest of the year off. You know, I say, let's go to the next level. And when I become a highly effective teacher, I'm not saying, and say, oh, I'm done. You know, can I go to that next level? And I think we're always going to that next level. It does push you. I mean, it does push it, you. And it's challenging, but it's also, you know, it seems like um, a positive thing that teachers who really um, are doing outstanding and exemplary work have an opportunity to um, 
get rewarded for that financially. Picture a kid in your mind and in all the work that you're doing, think of that child's face and that's who we're doing it for. We look at the like above and beyond ones, like the holy cow or whatever, and we say, wow, I, that is really hard to reach, but if that's the best thing for students, then that's what we should be doing, right? The world is changing. We're preparing kids for jobs that don't even exist yet. And how do we, we have to stay ahead of the kids. Mm -hmm. And so we, we have to, so raising the bar, that's a must. So I wanted you to see that, because I wanted you to see if you have a vision an exciting vision, teachers can be empowered to help implement it, to own it, to shape it. And, and at the really great districts in this country that are trying to forge the way to create 21st century districts, teachers are working collaboratively to define that vision. And it sits on top of project-based learning. Project-based learning will be a key component to attain those, but there's a common understanding of what a 21st century teacher and what 21st century teaching competency looks like that the teachers themselves are empowered to be part of shaping. It's very powerful to me. The third focus will come as no surprise to anybody here. It's a focus on pedagogy. And I started with it and I'll end with it. The most important part of a 21st century school or district is a school or district that's laser lice focused on making classroom practice change. That's why it's so great that you're here. That's why it's so great that BIE is an ally of yours in helping to shape that pedagogy. So how many of you have seen Susie Boss's new book? So here's uh, the, the front page of her book. Um, you all know some of the other great resources. I don't go anywhere now without talking about the great book to resources and tools for pedagogy around PBL. And um, there also is one other publication that you may not know about that you can get from the National Education website. For those of you um, out, from outside the US, it's nea.org. And look for this little 30-page gem. It's called Preparing 21st Century Students for a Global Society, An Educator's Guide to the Four Seeds. Doesn't go deeply into PBL, but it gives people a really interesting, quick introduction to why the four Cs might be important in their practice. Now, I know that most of you, how many of you have been exposed to Austin's butterflies? It's everybody, OK? So usually, uh, in most places I go, uh, how many of you have heard of Austin's butterfly? And one hand goes up, OK? So this is a little bit different. But I just want to share with you. For those of you who, uh, in, the, in the Leaders Institute, who don't know Austin's butterfly, maybe we'll do Austin's butterfly for them today or tomorrow. We'll take them through it. I'll be glad to do that, actually. Um, but for those of you that have been through Austin's Butterfly, what's the message of Austin's Butterfly? Collaboration. Collaboration. Collaboration, Collaboration among the students. But the message for me of Austin's Butterfly is not only that it's a model of what classroom practice needs to look like for collaboration among students, it's a model for what collaboration needs to look like among the adults, the teachers, and the, uh, the leaders in that building. But it's a beautiful example, and this is maybe the most important reason I wanted to show you Austin's Butterfly, is if you're not focused on why you're doing this, we want kids who can collaborate. We want kids who are creative. You'll never get to this pedagogy. The reason this pedagogy is so important is it breaks open a new way of thinking about how to help kids collaborate to improve their performance. We're not doing this. I, I, go, I, I give a speech once a week. Nobody's teaching Boston's Butterfly in their classrooms except expeditionary learning. And it's because there isn't this imperative to teach collaborative strategies. So that's why the vision of where you want to head and the pedagogy are inextricably tied to each other. And then lastly, I want you to focus on continuous improvement, or the schools or districts I visit that are really breaking through have a focus on continuous improvement. How many of you have been to High Tech High in San Diego? John Mergendaller did a wonderful thing, which is he took the Buck Board and the Buck National faculty together to High Tech High, and I'd never been there before. It was a fabulous experience. You could sense the spirit of collaboration and continuous improvement as soon as you walked in the room. And I went to Ben Daly, and I said to Ben, the chief academic officer, 
How is it that you're able to actually create the culture of continuous improvement and collaboration in your school? And he said two things. The first, he said, we hired a collaboration. We only hire teachers who want to collaborate. And if we've made a mistake and we've hired somebody who isn't a true collaborator, they're gone. We don't want them here. And I've had public school, I've had public schools in Arizona tell me the same thing. They hired a collaboration, and if the teacher's not a true collaborator because they want a spirit of collaboration without isolated teachers ruling the roost of their own classroom, with teachers really working collaboratively to move things forward. But he said, it's not just the hiring. The other piece is we have 15 or 16 protocols. And some of you have been using protocols this week in your work, right? But he said, the most important part of our 40-minute protocol is the last five minutes. The last five minutes, we always take the time to determine how effective the previous 35 minutes was. How good were we at creating a safe place for our teacher? How good were we at giving the teacher really creative, constructive input? Is the teacher now in a position as a result of this 35 minutes to go back and do a better job? That's a spirit of collaboration and continuous improvement I rarely see, and it's the fourth piece underpinning what I think is a successful 21st century school or, or district. So here, as I wind down, I just want to give you a couple of suggestions of what you can do as you, as you leave here. If you're a teacher leader, I want you to focus on the four C's in your classroom. I want you to commit, if you'll think, to commit or ask the question, how am I bringing the four C's back to my classroom? Secondly, obviously you wouldn't be here if you weren't committed to integrating PBL into your classroom. But as you operate in your department or as you operate in your PLC, please focus on the degree to which departments and PLCs are now not just focused on the content of their work, but are focused on integrating PBL and the four C's into their work. If that PLC isn't focused on that entire mission, it's not a 21st century PLC. It's a PLC doing 20th, 20th century work. And finally, I ask you to think about, as you leave here, what is it that you're going to lead? Are you going to lead a conversation in your school or district about project-based learning? Beyond what, you're, what you've learned for the classroom, are you going to go back and ask and tell your school, we need more P, uh, PD around PBL? Are you going to go back and tell your district leaders, we need more professional development around PBL? You got to do more than just go back to your classroom. You've got to create support in your school and your district for PBL and 21st century education both. And then for our, for our administrators who started with us today, your job is really simple. You've got to help your school and district define what's on and off your 21st century plate. And if you teachers are in a school or a district that hasn't done it, ask that it be done. It's a critical step to create the atmosphere you need that's a supportive environment for project-based learning. Focus on creating a culture of collaboration and continuous improvement. Support not only PLCs, but PLCs that incorporate PBL and the four C's into their work. And then think about whether you want to be part of a larger movement of leaders. We've created one in Ed Leader 21 that I'm happy to talk to any of you about, where we have superintendents and independent school leaders from around the country working together in a professional learning community to advance the four C's and 21st century education in their schools and their districts. So here's the last piece, and then we're going to end on this note. I want you to write down, and if you do it, do this on Twitter. Write down, as a teacher leader or an administrator, what will you do to lead 21st century and PBL forward in your school or district? Don't leave here with a list of pedagogical improvements alone. I want you to leave here with at least one challenge you're making to yourself to go back and lead PBL and lead 21st century education forward further than it currently is in your school or district. So 
I really appreciate the great work that you're doing here this week. I appreciate so much the great work that Buck does. And I want all of you, I want all of you to leave here owning a sense that you're not just part of the practice of project-based learning, but that you're truly part of a movement of bringing 21st century education to every student. Thanks so much. Great to be here. Thank you.